Last week, I was sitting at my computer, working away, and I started to get a headache. And then I started to get a little nauseous. And then as I got up to leave the building I was in to go get lunch, I realized how dizzy I was. I was being poisoned by carbon monoxide. We have invited fossil fuels into our homes and onto our bodies and into the very fabric of our economy. These hydrocarbons can seem like a necessary evil of modern standards of living, even though the consequences of their ubiquitous use threaten so much. Industrial design, my field, which dreams up and specifies so much of our stuff, is clearly complicit in our environmental problems, both directly through the extraction of non-renewable materials and indirectly through the enshrining of consumerism and individualistic, human-centered anthropocentrism. But the dominant approach to combating that harm, the way sustainability is being operationalized in design through measuring footprints, efficiency improvements, and recycling, is an approach that remains trapped in the paradigm of the Industrial Revolution and its dependence on fossil fuels. Because conventional sustainability is often focused on how we make goods. It's built on an assumption that human activity is necessarily and intrinsically harmful to an external nature, and it sees its job as to reduce this harm, which leaves the individual who is trying to be sustainable with generally two paths. One is to be less bad, to opt out, to do less and expect less, which doesn't scale and is out of touch with the reality of global inequality. Or two, vigilance, research, comparison, compromise, cynicism against greenwashing, and it ultimately burnout. But what if we could zoom out and design our system so that you could just be, live your life? What if the emergent outcome of all of our individual choices tallied up globally could not just aspire to being marginally less bad, but could actually be beneficial. To do that, we will have to reconsider not just how we make, but what we make with and what we make at all. To truly decarbonize, we will need better processes, but we will also need new raw materials, which will require new systems, new products and services to continue to meet human needs in new ways. Policy improvements are falling short. Internationally, we are bending the curve of global greenhouse gas emissions downward, but the UNFCCC is clear that when we tally up all of the pledges under the Paris Agreement, we're still going to be on track for 2.5 degrees Celsius global temperature rise if we meet all our pledges. Sustainability as it stands has proven ill-equipped for the speed, scale, and depth of the change needed to prevent and guard against the worst effects of climate change. And I would propose sustainability as it stands risks slowing or blocking the necessary transformational change because it limits our vision, it seeds division, and it cultivates doubt and paralysis. So you might be asking yourself, sounds great, but how could such a transformation at such a scale take place? Okay, you're right. We are living in such boring and stable times. <laughs> We are faced with a unique set of challenges, but we are also faced with a unique set of opportunities. Climate tech, material innovation, an embrace of vernacular tech, and synthetic biology in particular are just four fields changing the tools designers have to transform what we make with and what we make. In this merging tech, there is a future we can build of beauty and abundance, not just a desaturated version of the present. I don't believe we're on the edge of the fourth industrial revolution. I believe we're in the early days of the first de-industrial revolution. So I wanted to share with you today five principles of de-industrial design as I see it. First, de-industrial design is regenerative, not sustainable. Because what is the goal of sustainability, to be able to sustain. It tells you right there in the name. It's about maintaining, sustaining the status quo. It's intrinsically loss and risk averse. It's a mindset with built-in resistance to change. At best, it allows incremental innovation. Sustaining is being on a boat that's already half full of water and taking on more and bailing it out at the exact rate it's filling up. 
and then doing that forever. What this sustaining approach misses is that there is no status quo to preserve. We are in a world, a little boat, that's being rocked by accelerating technology on one hand and storms of disequilibration on the other. The sustaining approach also misses that to hold sustaining as the goal is blind to the debt already owed. There is already too much carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Global temperature and sea level rise lag CO2. If we stopped tomorrow, there would be more harm coming. And this is why the majority of the UN IPCC's positive goal-oriented scenarios rely on carbon removal technology, which we don't have yet. It's not ready to deploy. It's not scalable. So what if instead of sustaining, design had the goal of regenerating? Where sustainable design minimizes emissions, deindustrial design is carbon negative. Where one is a premium, marked-up category, the other is just the most ubiquitous offering because it is desirable and it's reached an economy of scale to be accessible. Where one rigidly minimizes, the other resiliently evolves. Where one apologizes, the other repairs. Deindustrial design is bio-based. In the domain of materials. The sustaining paradigm offers recycling and its more ambitious cousin, circularity, as processes for reducing harm. Circularity proposes that if all of our waste could be incorporated as feedstocks without losing value or performance, then we could solve the environmental harm of our stuff. But this model, centering as it does on waste, misses two important things. First is entropy. Things tend towards disorder. Even the best-made garment you cannot wear forever. Things break. Things mix. Second, circularity does not account for growth. The OECD projects that the demand for plastic is going to triple by 2060, and plastics are projected by the IEA to drive half of the demand growth for oil by 2050. We can't recycle our way out. So, what's the alternative? Living systems run against the grain of entropy by using free energy coming from outside of their systems to build their ordered complexity, their beauty. We need to build with photosynthetic materials that are driven by the sun, which is our source of free energy, <laughs> and which are made of carbon sequestered from the air. We need to move away from fossil fuel-derived molecules, which pull carbon from underground and bring it into our air. And if we do so, we can not only substitute our use of fossil fuels; we can create a market. For carbon-negative materials, for carbon removal, because it produces things that are, that are of value to our lives. Right now, more than half of our textiles globally are made from fossil fuels, and they're cheap in part because they're a co-product from the, with the fuels we burn. But innovations in catalytic chemistry mean that we are increasingly able to make the self-same molecules with no fossil fuels involved. We can make polyester, for instance, that's drop-in technical. Performs exactly like polyester, recycles like polyester, with no fossil fuels involved. And on the other hand, innovations in synthetic biology mean that we can make new polymers by feeding sugars to microorganisms that, through fermentation, make us things like PLA and PHA. Deindustrial design is innovative. One approach to making deindustrial design less harmful tries to quantify and compare multiple environmental impacts of different products or different approaches to making the same product. To Arrive through analysis at the most sustainable option. Aside from the various debates on the exact ways to do these comparisons, this technocratic approach is intrinsically convergent, and can only fundamentally offer a choice between existing well-described options. It models impact based on averages of limited available data to facilitate a choice off of a known menu. New offerings or approaches are often illegible to these top-down systems because these assessments are generalizing models, not audits of impact. So this assessment-based approach, which often requires the expensive help of experts, disincentivizes innovation and creates barrier to entry for new entrants. So what could be? Is there a world in which we could celebrate and prioritize innovation instead of optimizing through an engineer's mindset? What would happen if we invested a little bit more in a curious, speculative designer's mindset? Because with the acceleration of technology we're seeing right now, we have the opportunity for creative, divergent thinking and fundamentally new, disruptive opportunities, not just incremental refinements. We can't quantify what we've never prototyped. 
And because of emerging trends in technology, society, and economic possibility, there are authentically new opportunities that need to be given a shot. We're in a phase of accelerated change. We need to be taking bets on those white spaces as they open up. Four, deindustrial design is material. So some of you might be thinking, but there is an approach that increases, that approaches sustainability through creativity and divergent thinking, design thinking. But design thinking applies design processes from the manufacturer of physical goods to most often post-industrial, service-based, digital systems. Design thinking grows out of industrial design and its emphasis on physical things and is often brought in our post-industrial economy to services and platforms and digital challenges. Design thinking is often used to develop strategies and dematerialized, designed outcomes that are useful and help create more human-centered solutions, but have become more and more disengaged with material things that are where our emissions happen. Climate change happens to our bodies, not to our avatars. So instead of more design thinking as it is, what if we had more design thinking? As designers, we need to re-engage with the physical goods, the physical environments, the stuff of our lives, whose impact exponentially accumulates as it scales. And we must do this with a generation of creative minds. And finally, deindustrial design is productive. You've probably heard a version of the quote from the economist Kenneth Boulding, anyone who believes exponential growth can go on forever on a finite world is either a madman or an economist. <laughs> But what people often miss in this quote is the word exponential. There is an infinity between zero and one. Nature is growth. And in economics, growth is not just based on throughput, it's based on real productivity gains. Through technology, we're able to do more with less, less time, less energy, less resources. I have more brighter light, not because I hunt more whales than my ancestors. I have LED bulbs. They do more with less. Growth does not have to be zero sum. And becoming deindustrial does not have to mean going back to pre-industrial technologies or patterns of living. Before the Industrial Revolution, our technology for capturing the energy of the sun was only limited to photosynthesis. And commercially available solar panels right now are an order of magnitude more efficient at converting that energy. And according to NOAA, the amount of solar energy that strikes the Earth is more than 10,000 times the world's total energy use. There can still be growth. It might be at a different pace and of a different nature, but it is essential in a world where global extreme poverty is rising again. So what might deindustrial design look like? What might it feel like to live in a deindustrial world? What would it feel like to get back into a present tense relationship with the sun? I went looking for a feedstock to prototype a deindustrial material culture, and I found it in algae, one of the most efficient organisms at converting sunlight uh, into useful molecules and sequestering carbon. Marine macroalgae doesn't require fresh water, and in the right context, it can remediate ecosystems. And so I set out to make a substitute for plastic out of algae, and through hundreds of parallel and iterative experiments, combining emerging technology techniques and traditional craft techniques, through taking risks and failing fast, I created hundreds of beautiful failures that each taught me something and allowed me to develop this. This is a raincoat made of a plastic I developed that's made of marine macroalgae. It is completely fossil fuel free. It is embodied carbon. And it's a proof of concept of our opportunity to create carbon negative materials and a deindustrial revolution. Beyond the lab, I worked with my collaborator, Philip Lim, to explore a vision for the future of fashion, free of fossil fuels. I used design to speculate about the future, to combine scientific insight with emotional salience, to move away from the age of hydrocarbons and towards a new age of carbohydrates, where our lives are coherent with the renewable sources of energy and matter that we have across geological time and scale. We don't need a fourth industrial revolution. We need our first deindustrial revolution. And my challenge to you today is to bet on our future, invest in it, and get a carbon monoxide detector. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah.